it's good to have you on board. Uh, welcome to Living My Promise, uh, our weekly show. Uh, Rahul, uh, and it is good also to connect, reconnect with you after so many years. Uh, we used to play rugby together in the 80s. But uh, I'm not going to talk much about you because people know about you. You're an actor, you're a screenwriter, you're a director, you're a rugby player, you're a social activist. But we're going to talk more about that, and you've been a brand ambassador for some very prestigious organizations. We chat more about that also. Uh, to all our listeners out over here, welcome to Living My Promise. We're a group of people who basically pledge to give away 50% of our, the money that we have. Uh, I don't want to use the word wealth because wealth is relative, uh, either in our lifetime or in our wills. Uh, uh, and uh, it's really a way for people to connect with each other and learn from each other like what we're doing today. So Rahul, you've been, uh, as I mentioned, an actor, a screenwriter, a director, a rugby player, a social activist. Which of these roles has given you the most satisfaction and have your preferences changed over time? Louis, first of all, congratulations for uh, being a part of Living uh, My Promise. I'm um, it's, uh, it's not a small thing to pledge 50% of one's um, income, money, whatever you call it, uh, towards um, philanthropy, towards um, the easing of pain in the world, the way I look at it. So uh, wonderful that uh, you and your wife believe in the same um, principles. Uh, coming to your question, yes, um, my preferences have changed over the years. And... To the first part of the question, what gives me the most happiness? I think the way that I have managed to carve my life out, I don't really do anything that makes me unhappy. So whether it is um, writing, I write for my own films that I'm going to be making. I've only once written a film called The Whisperers for a very dear friend of mine. Rajiv, he was making, which I was in. Um, acting, if I didn't know anything in my life except acting, I would be delirious. Um, acting is, being an actor is a, I'm, I'm, in a, on a, I'm on a constant slow, a bed of slow ecstasy. It, uh, it never, it never, it never exhausts. It never drains away from me. It is uh, constantly replenishing. It, uh, it, feeds, it feeds me uh, beautifully as, as a person. But now that I've begun to direct, and I directed a film 20 years ago called Everybody Says I'm Fine in English. And after that, my acting career just didn't give me any time to direct. And I directed 17 years later, a film called Purna, which is a story of the youngest girl in history to climb Mount Everest. And um, I am absolutely sure that more than acting, directing gives me more pleasure because um, it challenges every single part of your creative soul. You are part architect, part musician, part um, psychologist, part uh, dramatist, and all of that put together. So it really is tremendously fulfilling. Although six out of 10 people never know the name of it, a director of a film that they loved, but that, uh, that, 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 putting that aside. As far as, um, I can't call it philanthropy. I would very much like to call it trying to do my bit to ease pain in this world. As far as that is concerned, that was never on the radar till I turned 35, I would say 2002. And a number of things happened in the country between 92 and 2002 that woke me from being a socially, you know, Lewis, I think all of us are born with some kind of a social conscience and it is mildly stirred up uh, through society and school and college and parents to say that you shall not litter, uh, you should not, um, you know, um, treat animals unfairly, the basic stuff where you feel that you're socially conscious. And then you become socially aware about problems that happen in the world. And very few people, and this is not something that you have to graduate to, become socially active. So from social consciousness to social awareness, to social 
active, to be socially active. I think that last step is what I'm talking about when I turned 35. And without really spending too much time, I realized the problems that, that really affected me most. I think we all have an umbra of pain and a penumbra of pain. And I wanted to focus on the umbra. And for me, it was communal harmony, uh, amity between people of, of, of different faiths and gender justice. These were the two and continue to be the two uh, extremely important um, factors that shaped me into thinking about what I could do uh, for society. And is that today with the foundation and with HEAL, is that one of, is that the thing I want to do most? Uh, certainly yes and certainly no. Certainly yes, of course. I mean, it's like a limb of mine now. No, because that would mean at the exclusion of everything else, which, um, which would just, it's, it's unthinkable for me not to act in direct. So yes, these are the two or rather three streams of my life that I consider to be indispensable. Have things changed over the years? Yes, as in I first only wanted to act. Now I love acting, but prefer directing. Earlier, I wanted to be uh, rich. I wanted to be respected and well-regarded by uh, my peers. Today, all of that has taken a distant second place to what I can do to reduce suffering in the world. That's an interesting point, Rahul. You know, there's a lot of young kids uh, presumably on the hearing this and the message about how you transition from being someone who wanted to be rich and well respected to, you know, saying today that, you know, I want to ease the pain of people. Uh, how did that journey happen? Uh, what are the lessons that advice that you could give to someone in their 20s who, you know, wants to go out over there and, you know, and, and be rich? What's your advice to them? Please do so. Please go out there and be rich. Don't stop yourself from an impulse that you have because it will come back to irritate you and at worst haunt you later on. There is the whole um, self-actualization pyramid. You know, you don't really need to ascend that pyramid. If all you want to do all your life is just be, and there are three common drivers of ambition, uh, wealth, power and fame. And some people want a combination of all three. Some people want one and not the other two and don't care about the other two. Whatever it is, at least start off by being honest with yourself and say, look, this is the kind, this is what I'm chasing. And when you start to chase it, my only advice to you, whether it's wealth, power or fame, is set yourself in your mind, in your soul to ask yourself, how much is enough? Because if you don't ask yourself that question, if you don't recognize that this, this much and only this much is enough and fool yourself by, oh, just a little bit of wealth is enough, you know, nice little flat here, then again, you'll be fooling yourself. So what is driving me and how much is enough? I think once you set that, the only thing I will ask, uh, whether it's whether you're young or old, if you have to answer these questions and you have, is at least can we start off by saying you will, on this journey, to gain power and wealth and fame, not harm anyone. Can we at least settle on that? Can we say that uh, you can do all of this without causing, knowingly causing any pain to anyone? And that I would put down, since we're talking about uh, the self-actualization pyramid, I would put down as the first step. Let people, let human beings fulfill their primal impulse. And it is absolutely acceptable. I did it. Uh, a lot of people can, you know, continue to do it. There is no, there is no hierarchy of goodness or purity or spiritual evolution. It, it, it is not that. Whatever sits well with you, please do. Because if you don't, anything else that you do will be colored with the sense of uh, regret or a sense of bitterness. And that's the last thing you want to do when you enter the world of philanthropy or you want to help people is to do it with a sense of bitterness or with a sense of regret. So let's get that out of the way. 
it is after that, that a lot of people turn to me defensively and say, you know, I mean, I really don't, I don't feel the urge. I look after my maid servant. I look after uh, my friend who is still in my, in my village. And I think that's enough. And I think it is. But there are people who don't even feel that impulse, Lewis. So to them, I have only one thing to say. What is that amount of money that if you were rushing to TIS or to Xavier's or to IIT, rushing to do your exam, and it's a three hour exam and you're already 10 minutes late. And this exam is a matter of your career. And you were rushing into the examination hall and some money fell out of your pocket. What is that amount of money that falls out of your pocket that you will not turn around to pick up, that you will just go on into the examination hall? That's what I want. Is it five rupees? Is it two rupees? Is it 10 rupees? Just start off by giving me that. Or if you don't have any money, what is that amount of time that if I asked you for, you would give me without even thinking? Hi, Lewis, could you teach uh, rugby to boys and girls in uh, underprivileged areas of Bombay for six hours a day? Rahul, are you crazy? I, I can't do that. Okay, can you give me six hours a year? Six hours a year, of course I can. It's 10 minutes a day for like 60 days. Of course I'll do that. That's what I want. Or if you have a skill, uh, Lewis, you're a, you're a fantastic violinist and you enjoy playing the violin. So could I ask you to play for people who are visually challenged for 10 minutes a day, just next to your house? So the idea is in the first step of giving, and we'll get to living my promise much later, if at all people get there, is to make it like, it's, it's almost as if they, were una, they, were, they weren't aware they were giving. It is like breathing, that simple. And once they see what that five rupees does, once Lewis sees what his 10 minutes teaching football with children does, or his reading to the visually challenged or playing the violin does, then it is my unshakable belief that the love, the appreciation, the gratitude that you will get from fellow human beings will start a virtuous cycle where you will realize, oh, boy, that feels, oh, that feels really good. It feels better than earning the next 10 lakhs. And then you might turn around and say, you know what, Rahul, forget the 10 rupees. It'll pinch me a little bit, but I'll give you a hundred. It'll just pinch me a little bit. It'll mean me not going to Domino's and ordering a pizza. And I think that virtuous cycle can only start with most people not on an intellectual level where they feel, yes, I have to give. Everybody is giving, giving is a good thing. No, I gave and I didn't even know I gave. And somebody came and said, thank you for putting my little daughter through school. And I'm like, what? I said, yes, your 365 rupees did this. If it starts there, then you have the best chance of casting your net across all of humanity. So you've talked about, I mean, it's interesting, you know, about the importance of starting small, giving something early on, uh, stuff which may or may not pinch. And, uh, and it's not just money, it's time, it's skills. When you look at your own journey, you talked about 1992 to 2002 was that period of awakening for you. Uh, was there any person also who inspired you to say, aha, I need to do something more? Or was it only the events that you saw happening around you? Well, it's the person you see sitting across the road begging. It's the person you see shivering with uh, this morning's newspapers under a plastic, uh, little piece of plastic on her head. I mean, it's, um, I remember going to, I won't mention the institution, one of the top engineering institutions in this country, in one of the top cities of this country. And they said, uh, we are so arrogant. We feel we know best. Uh, we have all the solutions. Uh, what can you tell us? Uh, I said that I just ask you to want to do one thing, just cross the road. Because in India, you just all you have to do is cross the road, and you will surely 
uh, meet someone or see someone uh, to whom you can devote your whole life to. You you can be partners in in making life better. And uh, so yes, of course there I I I understand your question. No, there has been nobody who has been a seminal influence. There have been many people, just like just like you, I'm sure. And there's not just one person who tips the balance. I was looking at a violence firsthand that occurred uh, in the early 90s in in uh, in at the time Bombay, um, and then beginning to alert myself to the kinds of violence that were being wreaked across the country, whether it was uh, uh, caste violence, and I remember this uh, unbelievably that it still happens, but there was an unbelievably horrific incident with the boat uh in Maharashtra, and I met uh, the father who survived. That brutal uh, uh, incident of caste violence, caste-based violence, and um, or whether it is meeting with a uh, hundred survivors of child, domestic, and uh, and uh, sexual abuse, um, uh, even amongst young young adult females, uh, or whether it was people dispossessed because of communal violence, it is these. It is it is these uh, incidents, not inc meetings, incidents. But yes, I did open my eyes and I did search and seek to talk to people, to 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 read people's works and say I would like to meet uh, so and so person. I would like to. So I I used to call, pick up the phone, and say, Do you know X person? And whether they were writers or intellectuals or people who were lawyers and activists, I would seek them out and I would just spend time listening. So I spent a lot of time in those. Right up till two thousand and five, two thousand and six, Lewis, just listening. I think it's the most underrated activity uh, amongst us in society. Is just to sit and listen. And I learned so much. I learned uh, through their anger, through their frustrations, through their deep, silent satisfaction of something having been been achieved. I learned how they negotiated uh, systems, how they negotiated uh, certain bureaucracies, whether it's in companies, whether it's in government. I, I understood that one had to be strategic in some cases, but as long as one as long as one wasn't selling one's soul, it was for uh, to reduce pain in the world, as I keep saying. So it was all of that. But if my if I hadn't actively pushed myself to to meet people, to read about stuff, to travel to corners of this country uh, uninvited, I would never have um, the knowledge or the experience that I have gained uh, from other people's lives. For that, and that was the busiest time of my acting career, and also the most successful from. 2001 to 2009. I mean, it was just the acting career just took off on a uh, beautiful upward trajectory and very satisfying creatively. I was shooting in Calcutta. I was shooting in with Santosh Sivan in Munar. I was shooting in Bombay. I was shooting Hindi films, Malayalam, Bengali films, English films. Yet through all that, I it was it was not a sacrifice. It, I felt the need to to understand to learn. Uh, and I have followed those same people, and I have seen how some of them have changed their positions over time, and I have seen how some of them have deepened their positions over time, and I have seen how some how some of them have abandoned their positions over time. And these are just lessons, you know, that you learn um, what what to do, and what not to do with your life in the future. Super. In fact, when you talked about you know not having regrets, I have this poster in my room. It basically says the only regret we have at the end are the chances we didn't take. So coming back to the question you made earlier about you know, if, you, if you want to do something, go do it and it will haunt you otherwise later on. And so true. So I'm getting a few questions already uh, uh, posed to us. Uh, and I guess, you know, given your acting career, etc., some of them relate to, <laughs> to that part of it. But you're the curator. You, oh. can, you can stop all those questions. We can talk about <laughs> True, we, can, we can talk about what no, you true. want to talk about. You control the... But, 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 what, yeah. but one of the questions come, which is very interesting, it's, it's from Amit Chandra. 
is asking celebrities can be great role models. Uh, and I just heard you say that, you know, what inspired you was not a celebrity. It was the poor person on the street, the, the girls shivering in the rain, you know, waiting to be looked after, etc., struggling for food, the starving person. But at the same time, it does have some impact. So you've done some fabulous work. And how can, and, and I know you've, you've already amplified some of the work you do. How can, you know, what you've done, how can you make it more infectious with other people? Or, or do you go about it trying to do it consciously or unconsciously? Let me uh, address the celebrity part of it first, that uh, Amit, who in himself is such an inspiration uh, to me, um, has spoken about. You know, Lewis, it's a double-edged sword. When celebrities take up causes, we as an audience, we as a people, have a very canny emotional intelligence. We can tell the celebrity who's doing something just to increase their brand equity, their brand profile, or whether that person is genuinely involved in that particular cause. You can kind of tell in 30 seconds. And you don't have to be educated, uh, you know, uh, in a school to, to understand those things. As a people, uh, Indians, the subcontinent, people are born with a great deal of emotional intelligence. So if the celebrity is doing it for his or her cynical means, it boomerangs on the cause. Like, what kind of a nonprofit organization is this that they are willing to get this actor on board who actually doesn't give a toss about the plight of survivors of domestic abuse, but is there because, you know, he or she is going to get some hokey award kind of thing or whatever it might be, or be named as brand ambassador or whatever, right? Or this person has really committed and we can see that commitment in her eyes, in, in the way she speaks. And of course, over the years, it just proves whether that person was in it for the, for the glory or for uh, something that impelled her from the soul. So that's the part about a celebrity, celebrity thing that I'd like to say um, in the first half. The second half is it also works against you in public. And let me say that the kind of uh, cynicism that I've had to face I'll give you a small example. When I started, uh, when, when the tsunami struck the Andamans, it was uh, Boxing Day 2004. I watched on television, as you would have too, Lewis, how mm -hmm. the tsunami struck Indonesia, it struck uh, Sri Lanka, it struck um, the Andamans, it struck coastal parts of India near Chennai, uh, Nagapatnam, Kadlur, and I was struck by the fact that I, don't, I saw no footage from the Andamans. I didn't know anything about the Andamans. I had no clue there were 576 islands in the archipelago. I didn't know that only 36 were inhabited. I had no clue that the population of the Andamans was the population of Kolaba. 5 lakh, 75, 76,000, must have gone up to 6 lakh by now. And that 90% of the people in the Andaman Nicobar Islands don't come from the Andaman Nicobar Islands. They are in fact uh, migrants who have gone there to settle from Tamil Nadu, from Andhra, from Telangana, from Bengal, uh, from Kerala, Punjab, there are sick farmers in Campbell Bay. So on the 29th of December, three days after the tsunami hit, I made about 90, 95 phone calls, trying to find some way where I could go there and go there first and figure out what I could do to alleviate, to help in rehabilitation and relief. I spoke to my the people I knew in NGOs in, in Bombay, and they were fantastic. We, in three days, cobbled together a network of NGOs, called ourselves the Solidarity Network. And I was supposed to be the eyes and ears of this network, going into the Andamans, reporting what was needed, maybe some gaps the government couldn't fill, and helping. So when I walked into uh, the office of one of the people in charge of uh, relief and rehabilitation in the Andamans, the first thing the officer says to me is, Mr. Bose, I know why you're here. So I said, really? Uh, 
have you heard of our network? He said, no, no, I've not heard of anything. You are here for your personal glory. You are here because you now want to attach yourself to this cause and you want to be seen as a, uh, the great martyr who has come and who's helping the, um, the dispossessed in the Andamans. Of course, he wasn't as, uh, he wasn't as eloquent as, as I am right now, but this was the point of what he was making. He said, so you can please go back. So I said, that, so the last time I looked, this was a free country and I can go wherever I want to, but obviously for me to help, I would require your assistance. He said, yes, I'll tell you what, you write down in triplicate what your network is going to deliver to the Andaman Nicobar Islands in terms of relief and rehabilitation and put a date to each of these things and a quantity. You give me a copy, you keep a copy and one copy you please submit to the Relief Commissioner's office and we will hold you to that. If you don't deliver, we will make that public. If you deliver, good, that's what you came here for. So I said, sir, I won't know what was needed in the islands unless I visit the islands. He said, no, 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 you won't have to visit anything. You will not go anywhere. You take out, take out a, a piece of paper and a pen, I will tell you. I said, you will tell me what? He said, I will tell you what we need. I said, sir, have you been to the islands yourself? He said, no, why should I go? Everybody tells me what is needed. I, I know what is needed. You write down, you write down. So I excused myself politely from the office, came back to the hotel where I was staying. And the very famous writer, Amitav Ghosh, who's a dear friend, had traveled with me. He wrote a 10,000 word piece on the tsunami and displacement, which I urge everyone to read after that trip. And Amitav told me, he said, listen, Rahul, there are officers and there are officers. And if this person is, and this is a small place, if this person is going to wield his power and stop you from doing work, why do you want to break your head against a stone wall? There are so many parts of India that would, that require help just because they haven't been affected by a tsunami, doesn't really matter. And I said, I agree, but I am not going to leave this place. And so what I did, Lewis, just to close the loop on this, I went to his boss's 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 boss. Uh, I always believe that in life, if there is injustice, gross, blatant injustice being wreaked on you, and there's a hierarchical setup, then you should break the rules and go over this person's head. If this person is behaving, as I believe this person was, anti-human, stopping somebody from helping somebody else. I mean, who does that? If it turns out that I'm not helping anybody, throw me off the island, I have no problem, but give me a chance. And I stayed and I spoke to this boss's 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 boss in this impossibly large office in Delhi. And I, I used this exact phrase. I said, this person is anti-human. He said, aren't you being a little bit dramatic? I said, no, this is exactly what he said to me. And I'm saying that you have to give Indians a chance to help other Indians. It, how, how do you stop that? And because the Andaman and Nicobar Islands were so tightly controlled by the government, you really can't do anything if the government doesn't want you to. And so that person was, I suppose they looked into other complaints and activities and things and he was transferred three months later. I stayed on for 30 months. I made 30 trips. At the time, I remember each trip would cost me close to a lakh going there, coming back. You had to fly, staying in a hotel, staying for 10, 15 days, then going back, coming back. And that's when I decided to start the foundation. And I'm sure we'll talk about that, I'm sure, soon. And so it's been 17 years that I've been in the Andamans. And I'm still there, and God knows where that officer is. But have you ever seen a photograph of me in the Andamans? In 17 years, have you ever seen one photograph of me in the Andamans, barring the times I now go as the ambassador of the Andamans, Andaman Nicobar Marathon. So I'm running in the Andamans. I posted a picture 
on Instagram three days ago. The Lieutenant Governor, it's Union Territory, gave me the Commendation Award for my services to the Andamans in 2013. I think 13. So I posted a picture of that uh, because I came back on Facebook kind of thing. And barring these two photographs, you don't see a photograph of me sweating and giving, you know, relief to people who are looking at, at, at me with gratitude and tears in the eyes. Of course not. For me, and this is an indirect extension to Amit's question. For me, when I engage, I use my celebrity status where it helps. I have to fight it where it doesn't help but it never interferes with what I, it, it never enters my consciousness when I'm doing what I'm doing. When I'm deep in the bowels of Manipur on the Manipur Burma border, and I'm speaking to children who have no clue who I am. And I'm writing on the blackboard what the foundation does. And somebody is translating into different languages, cookies, nagas, tribals. And through all of that, do I ever carry the mantle of Rahul Bose, the actor or the director? I mean, it's, it's stupid. It's, it's self-defeating. I've, I've, I've never done that. And I, that's why very few people know what we do because it's, it's not my game. This is not about increasing my brand value. Uh, you know, it's been 15 years and I just, you know, you do what you, what you have to do. So let's, let's move now to the foundation and some of the work you're doing over there. The two questions we've got, one is from Ashok Iyad, who says, hi Rahul, we are the newest Living My Promise Promises, Sarika and he. Uh, here's a question, how do you make the choice between working for one, helping one person, family, you know, just helping someone individually, or thinking and investing for scale to impact the poor through institutions like the foundation, and the second question is a follow-up question from Amit again, which is, uh, you know, how do you, how do you make the choice of say spreading your money across various people and spreading it thin versus doing a concentrated effort like in the foundation? How do you make that choice? Okay, so I'll take the second part first, Lewis. Yep. This is this harks back to what you and I were chatting. Rather, I was telling you about um, in the beginning of the talk, which is. From the center of my soul, at the, at the umbra, there lie these two, three causes. Uh, children, yep. gender justice, common harm. So for me, it was very easy for me to say that this is where I'm going to be channeling my resources, whether they be time, money, or skill. Um, if I hadn't started the foundation, why, where would the bulk of my money have gone? To a cause very similar to it, uh, which I couldn't find, by the way and or and today i do divide my money between that and heal which is the child sexual abuse ngo which yeah. for the first seven years we just nobody was prepared to give any money to a non-profit that worked on child sexual abuse it's remarkable how india has changed that in the last seven eight years people are wanting to give money for domestic violence or child sexual abuse these, especially child sexual abuse was, was not a very comfortable topic to talk to with funders or with schools and colleges to go and do workshops and talks till about seven, eight years ago. In a very dark and sad way, I think the Nirbhaya episode uh, made people think about gender violence, women, and also girls. And I'm not saying uh, child sexual abuse only happens with girls, far from it, it's half and half almost. But that's how the whole attitude changed. So that's just taking what Amit had said a little bit further. Um, as far as the, the couple that have just joined, um, I, I forget their names, if you can just tell me. Ashok and Sarika. Ashok and Sarita have just joined Living My Promise. Um, I actually don't do the macro, uh, Sarita, uh, Ashok. I actually do the micro. So I think this is a perfect time with Lewis's permission to tell you what we do at the foundation so you will actually understand. So it's a given that there are massive inequalities in developmental indices in this country. So the, when I was in the Andamans, I, I just couldn't grapple with the fact that whether you cross into a 
very, very low income uh, housing, um, illegal temporary housing shelter on a part of the pavement in Mumbai, or whether you go to the Andamans, you're struck by the stark inequalities in this country. That's a given. So I was thinking to myself, how does one equalize development uh, in a country like India? And then I looked at many, many cases in Africa, and I spent some time reading and talking to people about that. And in many nations in Africa, the developmental model has failed only because uh, big agencies have driven in in their Land Rovers and told, for example, I'm just giving you a loose example, farmers who are starving don't grow maize anymore or don't grow paddy anymore. Um, please grow sugarcane because it's a very uh, profitable cash crop. And so the farmer has gotten the seeds or the shoots and the fertilizer from these people in their white Land Rovers and for five years she has grown sugarcane and made money. So once these people in their white Land Rovers vanish, they come back five years after that only to find that she's growing wheat or maize or paddy all over again. And they say, didn't we, didn't we teach you to grow sugarcane and look how much money it got you? And she would answer that, but my children don't eat sugarcane. They eat uh, they maize. Uh, the, the villagers and the, the place around me, the demand is for wheat, maize and paddy, not, not for sugarcane. So it was very clear to me that for a developmental model to work in any part of the world, the people of that land who are connected deeply, physically, viscerally, emotionally to that land must decide what model of development they want and what stops them from arriving at the wisest choice? Exposure, education, education through exposure and learning. It's only once they see the good, the bad, the ugly developmental models across the world that they can then go back to the Andamans or to uh, Manipur or wherever else and say, this is what is needed in our region. This is what it ne is needed on our island. So we said, fine, in that case, what do we do? We need to expose people from the islands to all kinds of development and then let them decide for themselves. So I'm cutting a long story short. We selected six children, six Sarita and Ashok, six from the Andaman Nicobar Islands. It took a year and a half to select six children. Many, many parameters, least of which academic, most of which compassion, a rootedness to your land, a fierce love for the islands and a belief in, in the goodness for all, in, 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 in a good life for all. At 11, you can, you can choose a child, it's still a lottery. And then we put them in what we believed were the correct schools and colleges for them to learn outside the islands. Rishi Valley, uh, in, um, um, uh, outside Bangalore, in Madhnapalli, um, school, colleges. And today the Andaman Nicobar kids from the age of 11 are 25. And they're going to go back to the islands when they're 30 after having finished graduating. The first design and architect major in the history of the Andaman Nicobar Islands is a tribal girl from Nicobar, Matrina Martin. And she's today working for a label, a home shopping label called Nicobar, where she's designing stuff from Nicobar. And Matrina's trajectory is now to go and become work with artisans in the field, whether it's in Jharkhand or Chhattisgarh or Kerala. And then the next step in her trajectory is going to be to go back to Nicobar and start two things. The first design school, you don't have to be educated to join a design school in the formal style of education. And also to not resurrect, to create the fortunes of villages in Nicobar doing stuff that they always did, but it's, it's Nicobari handicrafts that nobody knows about. Nobody has a clue. And mainstream that across the world into the next, you know, not home shopping or home decor, whatever it might be. But the effect that Marina's education will have in Nicobar will be twofold. One is nobody will have to leave Nicobar to become a Matrina because through the depth, the richness and the wisdom that she has imbibed over 20 years and she has responded to and she's shared and she's grown into, everybody will hear what she has to do and say. 
and through the actual stuff that she does. One of my other kids, I call them kids, but they're 25, is work is, is has been working on the best, one of the top hotel chains in the country on sustainable tourism. And today, and you know how the Andaman Nicobar Islands are going to be, uh, they keep talking about it becoming a hub for tourism. When she goes back, what lens will she look at tourism with? Already I can tell you that their developmental model for the Andamans does not include cars. I mean, you and I can't think about that. They're like, Bhaiya, why do we need cars? We need two electric buses and a community fishing boat, or maybe two community fishing boats, one for women, one for the men. And that's what we need for the, this island. What we do need here is 5G. So Lewis, in our developmental model, 5G and a fancy car go together because it's money linked. I have a fancy phone, I have a fancy car. For them, 5G is necessary to reach out to the world from where they are and get their work done. But a car isn't. Status doesn't exist on those parameters on the islands. So that's what I mean by, and it's as Amit and I have discussed, Amit Chandra and I have discussed, this is such a long shot. It is such a foolish, uh, almost foolish risk to take that 20 years later, will these children go back? But we, four years later, we went to Jammu and Kashmir, selected six children. And today they are 20 years old in scholarships in universities like Ashoka University, Shiv Nadar University, Symbiosis University, Safaya College, doing supreme, one of them is going to become a scientist for sure. One of them is going to get into aviation, I think. And one of them is working very, very strongly nowadays on human rights. So then, then we went four years later. It takes four years for our one, one region to actually, for us to get grips on the school there, you know, for them to settle into their schools and things. And then we go to a new region. Then we went to Manipur. Our Manipur kids are 16. Uh, they're in boarding schools right now, virtually learning from home. Yes, so Sarita and Ashok, this is very micro. When I ask corporates for funds, I never get it. They're like, six children, 18 children? You're spending crores on them. I mean, not me, but with the scholarships and things. Why would, I mean, what would the numbers show? That we have spent 10 lakhs this year on such and such child, one child. But we can feed 10,000 people with 10 lakh rupees. I say you can feed them once. You can give them one meal or two meals. But this, when they go back to the Andamans or to Kashmir or to Manipur, they will be the engines. And I'm going to put them in front of government and say, look, these are the six most wise, most deep, most compassionate, most, most emotionally educated, as well as intellectually educated and exposed adults you will find in your life in this region. Use them and see what they want to do and see what you want to do with them. And you know, make them spawn a hundred other matrinas and a hundred other uh, mukaddases. Sure. So that, uh, that, that's fabulous. And you know, one of the things that I also spend a lot of time on is exactly the same. How do you build up capacity in these places which are homegrown and not just from outside? But now let's move to the other part of your life because we're getting some questions on that, which is zero TSA. So Venkat's got a question about, you know, one of the challenges around abuse is that women, including those in power, are unwilling to accost the, perpet the perpetrator or talk about abuse in public. How can we build an environment that encourages women to come forward and speak about that? Another question was from Atula Kapoor, which talks about, and I just sort of bunch some of these things together with TSA so you can look at them in totality, because uh, we're running out of time. The second is a, a large number of children living in rural and remote places take hazardous routes to work. How do you keep them safe in those places? And the third is uh, from R.T. Madhusudan, who's again doing a lot of fan fabulous work. If you were to believe the assumption that women are more empathetic, does it think it makes sense to try to get inspire more women celebrities to engage, give volunteers, and uh, and get them involved? Uh, I think that uh, yep. Yeah. And okay, also, so by the way, I've been, I've got a message from Sushant Singh. Can you have time to extend it by five ten minutes? Oh, sorry. Because there's a certainly. lot of interest. Okay, great. So let's go ahead. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, as long as people are listening, I'm happy to chat. Um, so as far as uh, I think uh, Venkat's question was about the, was about the uh, yes, about people how, getting on talking, yeah, accosting their perpetrator. Yes. 
I think there are always two ways that something like this breaks, if I can use the metaphor glass ceiling. What happens is that to, to break out, to break an issue out from a private discussion uh, and make it from a, to take the shame away from the, the person who has survived that ordeal versus the perpetrator, one very strong way of doing this is for role models to come out and talk about their personal experiences. So when I talk about perhaps the humiliation that I have faced at the hands of some official somewhere, uh, it, will, it will empower people to say, okay, this happens to him. So next time it happens to us, we're not gonna be uh, put off by it. So when you have, oh my God, this happened to her. I, 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 never, I, never, I, I never thought it would. And this happens to anybody therefore, so there's that, 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 that thought happens. The second is, especially with child sexual abuse, violence against women, I find that there has to be a 360 degree messaging across society where we understand who is to be shamed and who should not be feeling the shame. Um, California had a very interesting case study on trying to stop people from smoking. If I'm not wrong, this was in the late 80s or the early 90s. And they conducted, and they might still be doing it, a 25-year campaign. This is California State. This is government bodies. The first thing they did was they raised the price on cigarettes. I think by a third or, or maybe double. And they channeled all that money into a multimedia campaign. So wherever you went, you would see on hoardings, radio, television, bus shelters, buses, signage and messaging saying that smoking is bad for you and here's why. Then they went into all the community schools, Lewis, and they had community celebrities, role models going in there and talking about the ill effects of smoking and artists, like a magician would go into a primary school and take out black, uh, a black snake from his mouth. That's what came out of smokers' mouths. And it would take out red roses from a mouth and say, that's what happens when you don't smoke. Schools and colleges picked up on this. So there was a rap, comp there would be rap music competitions to compose a song based on the ill effects of smoking. S children were asked for their summer holidays to do their summer projects as an audit of how many people in their area, in their neighborhood, have been ill due to smoking or have missed work. And why have they missed work? Has it been lung related diseases? So as you can imagine, you're now, and of course, they prevailed upon television uh, series and films to either stop showing smoking, which I don't agree with. I mean, it all depends on what the message of the final message of the film is, but maybe there would be a court case in a legal drama about somebody who is trying to sue a tobacco company, et cetera, like, like The Insider where in which Russell Crowe was. So that community had this messaging coming from every side, directly and indirectly, but always interestingly. And the incidence of smoking, if I'm, again, if memory serves me correctly, went down by 25%, you could say only, or you could say, wow, where it took, uh, I think, a couple of decades for that to happen. So here's the thing. When you're looking at changing attitudes that have been ingrained for long, you have to attack it from 360 degrees. And my last submission is you have to look at yourself before you even breathe a word to your children. Because if, if I see my father walking into a CST station, three steps ahead of my mother to catch the Rajdhani Express to Delhi. And I guarantee you, Lewis, when I get married, I will walk into CST three steps ahead of my wife to catch the Rajdhani to Delhi. 
So too many parents have been telling their children what to do nowadays. I keep saying, show them how to be. Do you really get up during the time of the pandemic and do the jhadu katka and the dishes as often as somebody else in your family? Are you genuinely uh, gender neutral? Would you really give the same deadline to your daughter as you do for your son when they're going out at night? Or would you pretend it's like for her safety and you know you would, you would hide under other kinds of um, excuses? And children pick up on this. Do you cut your wife short when she's speaking on the dining table about a certain issue with your opinion? And you know, it's shocking. It's shocking when you turn the lens onto yourself, how many times we fail at these tests. So that would be the, the ecosystem celebrities, 360 degrees and turning a lens inward that I would say. Uh, sorry, and I, I think I've missed something in the middle. Atula had asked something, safety of so boys now, and girls yeah. as they uh, travel it's to- It's really about the people in remote places and the safety over there. How do you, you know, facilitate making life easier for them? Kids who have to cross rivers, et cetera. Yeah, you know. And by the way, I just, I just want to come back, Rahul, to something else you said, which is so true that uh, we've had, you know, friends of us ask us, you know, how can we, can we talk to their kids? And we said, no, we've got to talk to you first yeah, because kids see what you do. And don't expect your kid to go out and want to work somewhere if you yourself are not willing to do that. Kids see that. And you know, so come back to sorry, yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. So uh, this is a tough one. Women should not have to walk for water. Girls should not have to walk for water. Children should not have to walk 15 kilometers to a school. It's easy for us to say that. I get Atula's point. How do you make these daily travels that are so fraught with danger less dangerous? You know. At some point, the community has to kick in. At some point, you know, it, you can't just expect the police or expect, you know, government workers to be there all the time or, or people from NGOs. At some point, the community has to kick in. And when I used to speak to 80, 90 girls at Akshara Center, uh, this wonderful gender justice organization in Bombay, uh, and these were girls from, from very, very low income housing, low income uh, strata in, in, in Bombay and all religions. I mean, some were uh, Dalits, some were, uh, you know, from upper caste, but Hindus, Muslims. And I would say that if you have to create some kind of change, and in this case, safety, you're gonna have to collaborate with people in the community. If as a young girl, you want to study in school, speak to the person who is most likely to be somewhat open to allowing you to go to a school. Maybe your grandmother studied till grade two. So maybe what you can do is fight to study till grade four. And if you do that with a chacha or a chachi or a kaki, who would just try and get people to, to form a little coalition to push for your for your needs. It's strategic, but it's the way you have to do it. And in this case, to show the community that the safety of any child is the safety of your child in the future, or cast your mind back to when you were a child and you felt scared crossing that river. And why can't we, all of us get together and build a little rope bridge over it or whatever it is. Empathy, Lewis, is something that, um, by the way, I disagree, I think, I don't know who said that, that women having more empathy than men. Um, I don't think it's gender specific, of course. Um, yeah, I don't think it is. So I think empathy is a very strong tool that one can use. Look, you know, it's always an up uphill battle, but I keep saying that the way things move in some sectors, Lewis, it's like a massive rock rolling down, um, rolling down a road. Um, and everybody's hurt, 
hurtling and throwing their bodies in front of this rock and getting crushed beneath it. But the law of physics says that that resistance will make that rock even infinitesimally lose its momentum. And one day, there will be the last body that will stop that rock. And the next body will actually push the rock back the way it came. And that's what you and I will recognize as change. But that's not true. The bodies that came before that to infinitesimally slow the rock's progress through down that road are as important as the body that actually the first body that begins to move the rock back from where it came. It's all the same force, except that one is visible and gets all the credit and the others don't. And I'm dead sure in my opinion that in my lifetime, uh, mine is going to be one of those bodies that gets crushed as the rock moves on. Uh, and hopefully infinitesimally, one will be able to slow it down. Well, that's a fascinating sort of analogy, which I'm going to borrow a lot about how the various bodies actually slowed it down. And that's actually a question which Sridhar Setuvaman was asking. Uh, what keeps you optimistic about India and keeps you going? And I, why do you want to be one of those bodies that sort of slows it down? As opposed to saying, I'm going to step away and let that roll off go down. Well, uh, I have no option. My heart compels me to. I really have. This is not something that I'm... This is not something that I have to think about. Uh, would I... I can't stop myself with India, if you know what I mean. Yeah. There is something in this subcontinent that I... Countries are made, right? But there's something in this subcontinent, something in, something in our emotional excitability, our messiness, our openness, uh, something about generosity. And please, these are all generalizations. If you say this about the subcontinent, I know that the opposite is equally true. I get that, but I'm just talking about me. That is a, there's a, I just feel connected to the, the soil. One kilo of which I've eaten in 35 years of rugby, of course, in 40 years of rugby, uh, <laughs> physically, physically eaten, but I just feel, I just feel connected. Like if I was given the option to go anywhere else in the world and, and settle down with the same amount of comfort and fame, uh, I wouldn't. It's a no-brainer. I just, I just can't. So there is that. Outside of that, to be moved by the unbelievable generosity of people who have nothing to give has happened to me everywhere. I mean, I've, I've been fortunate to receive that in the favelas of uh, Rio. Uh, I've been fortunate to, to, to have that, I mean, in Bhutan, you know. So it's not India or the suffering of Indians, but it's, it's the people I know best. It's, you know exactly when they're going to cry when they're watching a film. You know what I mean? You just, you know it best because you're most familiar with it. But there is definitely, I cannot, without a shadow of doubt, I will admit to the fact that I feel connected in ways that are completely disconnected with my success uh, or my fame that I've achieved here. I just love, I don't love, I, it's, it flows through my, through my body. This, this, this land flows through my body. Super. You know, when you talked about you know, eating mud on the rugby field, around 30 years ago, I was playing in a, in a game we possibly were on the same team, and the scrum collapsed on me, and it was monsoon, so it was flooded, and I thought I was going to drown. I thought it was the most stupid thing that I thought I was going to drown on, on land because there's 50 people on top of me. That's when I decided I'm too old to be playing here. But you know, I, I guess we have time for one more question. And again, you know, as I said, this is always a, the Bollywood, uh, the angle uh, attached to it. So Mira asked one of the first questions right at the beginning. Kiana, and it also ties up with how you also said that, you know, you don't see photographs of you in the Andaman. So the questions are one, can a writer, actor, director like you, uh, thinking and speaking of philanthropy, create a ripple uh, of effect of giving in Bollywood. But I want to extend it further. 
Today, people know that your intention is honorable. It's not to get the brownie points and tell Rahul's a good guy. He's been over there. Uh, he's not there just to get his photo taken. Is the time come for you to get more out and use your uh, use the work you're doing more visibly, and therefore get other people more motivated than saying, "Listen, I'm happy. People may not know what we're doing at LCSA or in the foundation, but we're doing good work and we're happy." Or I'm going to get myself out more in the news, not to help me, but to help the cause, because people know that my intentions are honourable. Yeah, I think that time has come, Lewis. After 15 years, I think that time has come, where we can unabashedly and without any kind of uh, fear of being misconstrued, uh, go out there and put that out. So during uh, during this lockdown period, I've been thinking about that. Perhaps it is now becoming selfish to not share the kind of uh, work that one is doing, not in a self-congratulatory way, but in a way that will hopefully inspire people to do, to do this in other parts of the country, or maybe in the same parts. So yes, that is something that I've begun to actively think. And I've already spoken to the director of the foundation. I've told her, I said, listen, let us look at really transforming our public profile in 2021. So that's one thing that's going to happen. The second thing is, um, how can I inspire people from my industry to, uh, to be givers and all of that? Uh, the simple answer is I can't. I don't try and inspire anybody. I, I speak about the deep happiness it can give you. I ask people to look into the umbra and penumbras of pain that they hold inside, everybody holds it. Most people don't either bury it or prefer not to think about it. And then when I awaken them to the pain that they might not articulate, but that they are now articulating to themselves and recognize that this is what really hurts them and they've been burying, then automatically the answer comes, what can I do? And the first thing they have to do is to help themselves. The first thing they have to do is to be kind to themselves, to, to really use that warmth and empathy for themselves. And then once that healing starts to then say, okay, this feels, and, and at last I feel I can breathe. So the first step that I have done occasionally, when the time is correct, not at some premiere or some party, but when the time is correct to just talk about individual umbras and penumbras of pain and uh, to some very famous people and then have them not thinking strategically as to which cause to support, but to think spontaneously and emotionally. Sure, lovely. Okay, then I'm gonna ask you the last question and then we'll wrap up because I've taken up more, more we've, we've extended the time because it's been such an interesting conversation. Uh, why did you, what made you decide to pledge 50% of your wealth uh, and be a promiser? Secondly, uh, how could we get more people to, to give in a significant manner? And again, not just to say that I'm this great person who's given, but how do you get more people to give both money, time, and skill? And uh, yeah, any okay. thoughts on that? Uh, first of all, what made you decide to join? Well, look, I had already given so much of my money when I started the foundation uh, and heal later on. And, uh, you know, I, it was more than 50%. So for me to, when, when living my promise, when Amit spoke to me about it, it was, he knew that I was already living the promise. So I really didn't have to change my attitude or change my life to to pledge or to become part of this initiative. Um, according to my tax consultant, it's, it comes to, it's about 70% and he's very unhappy about it at times. But be that as it may, um, how do you get other people to do this? You know, Lewis, there's no other way but for them to, to start working on areas of personal pain. Once you do that, there's no limit to giving this. Because every time that you see that kid with a broken foot who can't play football anymore, 
and it thwarted your footballing career, then it's easier. It's easy to go out there and give money for the treatment of 17 lakh children with, you know, who want to play. Or, you know what I mean? It just becomes very easy. I would say that is, it cannot be strategic. It cannot be an intellectual commitment. It simply has to be a soul commitment. And it has to, when I say, it has to come from the soul. And I'm giving it a name right now, but people don't, people just respond. This hurts them. Stray dogs, you know, Lewis, I care about them. Old people's homes, yeah, important. Cancer, definitely. I lost my best friend to cancer, Lewis. Cancer, I lost my mother to cancer. You know, what do you want? Tell me. This is as much money I have, but I have time. I have my home. You know, what can, how can I help? I make cardigans for a living. You know, in what way can I help? Is what you'll find those answers coming. Rushing, rushing out to, to you know, to, to help. That's the way that that will slowly arc to 50%. Nobody is going to turn around today and say, yeah, thus far and no further, here's 50%. That's not happening in life. You know, unless, of course, you're Bill Gates and you have some kind of a sense of evolution because of everything that you've received and seen over the years. But most people haven't. Most people are just wondering how they can get more meaning in their life. And I would say to start by first treating yourself what is it that you have not have, have have lacked or where does that pain reside and then you watch how that how that takes off after that it's it's like breathing then well, thanks rahul thank you for spending your saturday morning with us uh and it's good to chat up with you after all these years uh you know as, as a sort of a final note would love to uh, all our people listening on to follow, follow our Living My Promise page on Facebook. And also check out our website, uh, www.livingmypromise.org. Uh, thanks a lot, Rahul. Have a great weekend. And to all our people who've been listening over here, have a great weekend too. Thanks, Louis. My regards to your wife. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.